You've been rare so. recently. Yeah, we're uh, we're busy. It's uh, it's this point in time when you uh, you're f you, we finished the solution development, and um, it's been a quite an effort for about three years. We've had um, I'd say about seven hundred engineers working, and then seven hundred. Yeah, and Renault had about uh, fifteen hundred engineers on their side, uh, and now it's a lot of testing because you got to put up. How much did you raise again? Uh, we raised seven hundred million dollars. Seven hundred. Yeah. But I should let you explain, give us the update. Yeah, so, so uh, I don't know how many of you know Better Place. Uh, we're, uh, how many know Better Place? <laughs> um, we but we're well known. And <laughs> um, we're basically made a, um, an observation that you won't be able to replace the use of oil um, without actually providing a full solution for the way we drive cars. And, uh, and we started with a very interesting question. Uh, and Luak and I actually... Uh, we were in, uh, in Davos in 2005, and we got asked the question by, Carl, by Klaus Schwab, um, how are you going to make the world a better place by 2020? And to me, it translated to a question, uh, how are you going to run a country without oil? And from that question, uh, after making every possible mistake on paper, which is good, because if you make it on paper, it's actually faster, uh, I went down biofuels and hydrogen and all these other ideas, and then evolved to a question of, uh, how would you make an electric car with today's batteries, with today's science, with today's economics, uh, more convenient and more affordable than a gasoline car? And with the known limitations of battery that goes about 160, 200 kilometers, uh, it came to a, a very interesting uh, s uh, platform, if you want, uh, which has two components. One is the ability to charge the car at home and at work when you're parked for about eight hours. And then on the freeway, being able to switch the battery as you go, which, which is an idea we borrowed from the uh, French musketeers. Because um, they, they used to uh, ride their horses, and when the horse got tired, they didn't wait for the horse to eat. They just exchanged the horse at a place where they kept horses on, on the road and kept on going. And so the idea is if you cover a geographic span with uh, machines that are battery switches uh, that we, we actually built, we invented and built, uh, that allow you to switch the battery in about a minute. And then you can go anywhere you want to go. And the observation we've made is that for cars to be successful today, you, you have to have a service provider, also known as uh, g gas stations, <laughs> that um, effectively sell you gasoline as you go. They, they sell you kilometers as a service. And wherever you go and you run out of kilometers in your car, they sell you more kilometers. And you buy those separately from the car. You own the car, but you, you then can continue to buy kilometers almost on a weekly basis. So every week you get, get into a gas station, you buy a bit more kilometers. And so we came to the observation that if you separated the battery from the car, you can make an electric car that would actually get to be cheaper than the gasoline car as you scale to volume. And then if you take the battery and the electrons and the cost of the infrastructure, the, that cost is cheaper than gasoline. And a matter of fact, with today's batteries technology, with today's cost of electricity, the cost of a virtual liter to us is about a half a euro. And you know how much it costs outside to buy a liter, so you, you can understand that it's a fairly good margin uh, business. And then as this goes on, over time, you get um, more and more economies of scale. The cost of the battery goes down, like every el electronic device we, we consume. The cost of gasoline continues to go up, and Unlike oil companies, we've decided to be uh, benevolent giants in the sense that as the margin goes up, we're going to give the consumers back the extra delta when they buy the car. And so we basically tell you, if, when you buy a car, you get addicted to either oil or electrons. And if you'll get addicted to electrons, we'll give you a check so you can buy the car. And we, we sort of pay you to get addicted to, to milk instead of heroin. I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, that's the thought process. And, um, four, five years ago it was a white paper, four years ago it was a crazy idea, three years ago it was a company. Uh, now it's in tests in Israel and in Denmark, in Australia, we're, we're coming to Australia next. Um, and then we expect to see this covering pretty much most of Europe, China and the US within the next three, four years. So that's the, that's the story. Wow. Carlos, so Carlos Ghosn, who's a genius, who was here yesterday um, in Davos of 2007, uh, shook hands with, uh, with the President of Israel that they'll build the cars. He actually stood by his commitment. We have a beautiful car, set of cars that are coming in from Renault. 
um, that are fit this, to this model. The first one, the Fluence ZE, um, is a big car. It actually breaks most of the thought process around electric cars. It's, it's a five meter car, it's not a tiny car, it's a fast car. It's actually twice faster than the Fluence uh, diesel. It is, uh, it's actually gonna be cheaper to buy that than the, the uh, uh, same Fluence in Israel and almost half as much as the gasoline Fluence in Denmark. Um, and, uh, and we've tested it, it drives beautifully. Uh, it's in test right now, and we think it'd be one of the, the best-selling cars in history. We bought 100,000 of them, so we're, uh, we're kind of big believers. Just for Israel? Israel and Denmark. Yeah, I guess you deserve a round of applause. When will you have the first cars available? So we're, we're in tests right now, and, and you, you have to realize when you do so much engineering on, and most of the people here understand that, if you think of what we do as a platform, so before you start putting a lot of devices on the platform, you, you really have to test the platform. And so what we're doing now is every week we have a new set of tests and we're testing, first week was to drive the car and then to, to heat the battery and see what happens. And every week is a different set of tests, charging, and then you do a parking lot and then you do battery switch. And we got a battery switch system and we got a car that's just driving around the block and switches and drives around the block and switches. And we do that a lot of times. Um, the, the funniest part, we had to do this in, uh, in Tokyo. So the, the Japanese car industry didn't believe that you can do a switchable battery car. And so we got challenged by the uh, Japanese government to actually show that it can happen. And in, uh, in May of 2009, we actually put a switch station in Yokohama. And we had a car that did exactly that. It would ride around the, the tent and switch a battery. And when we were done with that test about a thousand times, um, most of the Japanese car companies said it's not fair because the car didn't drive on the streets. It wasn't a real car. So we reformulated the test and, the, and we asked what would be a fair test and they said, well, if you, if you had a taxi that would go seven by 24 for 100 days, then we believe you. So in uh, April of this year, we opened a taxi station in Tokyo and we had four taxis go, now it's almost 180 days and they just keep going and driving and switching and driving and switching and driving and switching. And after about 20,000 kilometers, we sort of asked them if it's enough, if they think that it would work. And so that's uh, like the plane model that they never stop, yeah. No, these cars actually, they, they take passengers. We, we only, obviously, we only have one station to prove. Uh, and so um, it becomes one of those things that you can show that with one station, you can drive yeah. across most of Tokyo. Um, and we put it in a glass enclosement so that you can actually put a camera and see that it works and that there's no magic, we, we're not doing any tricks. And, uh, and the funniest thing we found out, you only need to switch about twice a day, so it's, uh, the switch is 59 seconds, 59.1 seconds. Uh, but it ends up that a lot of the passengers ask the driver to take him to the switch station because they want to feel how it feels. And it's, it's one of those, it's a stupid Disney ride if you want, because you go with a car and you sit in there and everything moves around you, but you don't feel a thing because you're sitting in the car. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How, so, you, so the cars, so the tests are going right now. Uh, consumers will start driving in, in a contained way in a limited test in June. And then by the end of the year, we'll open both the Israeli and the Danish network. So by the end, of, about a year from now, less than a year from now, we'll a open A year both. from now. Yeah. And Hopefully so you both need tests are fine. You need a lot of government help. I know Shimon Peres says, um, well, he's a friend of yours. Well, you know, he's the president, so um, but he challenged me uh, to do this, but we, we didn't get any government money. So we, we did the whole thing on private money when I, I asked. Oh, you, you don't need financial help. Right. But you need, do you need any type of help? We, we need help from government to, um, to cover for the fact that in the beginning we're not in volume production. So if you look at, uh, at the fluence, I think Renault will make about 45,000 cars in the first 12 or 18 months. And a normal car production is about 500,000 cars a year. And so we, we got to cover for some of that delta in, in lacking volume, but that probably is going to be in place only for the first two, three years. Um, and mostly what they do is they, they reduce the taxes. So in yeah, Israel, you that's take, what I meant. Yeah, you take 70%. Give, give an incentive to people. To right, so, you, so in Israel, you, you pay 70% tax on, on a gasoline car, and they've reduced it to 10%. In Denmark, it's even more. Yeah, it's huge in Denmark. Denmark is 180% tax 
on a gasoline car yeah. and zero well, you percent. You buy the car. Yeah. And, and zero in electric. Yeah. It's, it's sort of an IQ test. Um, if you still buy a gasoline car, they don't want you to stay in Denmark anymore. And so, so it's, it's, uh, it's actually becoming a very interesting phenomenon. When you get an electric car at half price, what a gasoline yeah, you, car would it be. It doubles the price if you take gasoline yeah. and it divides it by two if you take. Yeah, so we're yeah. seeing that. But by the way, we're seeing that across in France with the 5,000 euro. Yeah, but that's uh, not enough. Um, I think it's a great start. I think that um, the effect would be the same effect. We, we actually believe that the market tips when an electric car costs the same as a three-year-old gasoline car. So the decision on green versus oil is a tough decision for a lot of people, but th the decision of new versus old for the same price yep. is very easy. If you ask most drivers, would you like a new car or an old car, they'll tell you, I'll take a new car if it costs the same. And once you get the cost of an electric car to be the same as, as a three-year-old gasoline car, I think you see the entire market tip. And, and with economies of scale and, and the cost structure of battery versus gasoline, gasoline keeps going up. I mean, it's the highest price now in Paris since the uh, 2008 summer. Um, and battery continuing to go down. I think that by 2015, 16, you'll see that price tip. When do we do this with planes? Can you, like, you should be more visionary and now do this with planes. <laughs> we had Bertrand Picard yesterday. So we left it to Bertrand to actually do a plane that will fly forever, but I wouldn't recommend Bertrand to switch his batteries in midair. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a tough proposition. <laughs> How fast do you think we'll, so you're saying we want to end oil. We want to be the company that ends oil. Like, that's a pretty good target. When do you think, when do you think that that can happen? So you can applaud, by the way, that's, that, you know. <laughs> Thanks. When, when, when do you think it... I think that the, the, um, the economic model that you see, and it's almost like a Moore's curve, the cost of a kilometer on a battery um, is cut down in half almost every two years. Because the, the life cycle of the battery improves and the cost per kilowatt hour decreases. And almost like Moore's curve, if you have something that cuts in half every two years, as, as I keep telling uh, investors, if you don't like my business model, wait six months. I mean, it's, it, it just gets better every six months. Um, sooner or later, and we're talking probably about 2015 or 16, the, the cost of a new electric car uh, with the cross-subsidy uh, will go under a three-year-old gasoline car. And then at that point, you're probably a year or two after that, you, you won't get another new gasoline car coming into a market. So I would predict that Europe probably by 2020 it would be a very negligible number of gasoline cars, new gasoline cars coming into the market. By 2020. China will probably end oil way, way before that. So I was about to ask you why. Have you been to Beijing lately? <laughs> it, it used to be that you couldn't see from one side of the street to the other side of the street. Now you can see the side of the street from within the street. So you got to a point where they ran out of the two most important molecules, oil and air. And when you can't breathe in a city and you don't have oil, you really want to get off of oil. And then they found out that the interesting um, effect is they can leapfrog the European and American car industry. So they can build an electric car much easier than they can build a, a great gasoline car. And if you look at where they are, next year, 2011, China will make more cars than Europe and the US combined. And they see their ability to actually disrupt the global car industry by going electric and generating um, an advantage, if you want, a, a, an industrial advantage that will allow them to build the middle class. Because when the middle class was built both in the US and Europe on the car industry. And so they're, they're thinking of it in much bigger terms. This is, they're building Detroits, not Detroit, but Detroits for electric cars. And they've done it before with, with uh, electric scooters. One day they decided you're not allowed to take a gasoline scooter into the city. Yeah, and the non-democratic helps. By the, by the end of that same year, China made more, sco more electric scooters than the entire world. So um, they know how to do it. Looks like. Yeah. Personal platform. Yeah. Can you, you know, maybe we should talk about how we met and uh, that's something that happened in Zermatt, right? We were both part of this program called, uh, whatever, uh, the World Economic Forum program called yeah. Yeah, Young Global Leader. So, so we, were, we were young global leaders on a mountain in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Swiss Alps, and we got asked that question of um, um, how are you going to make the world a better place? And I still remember we, we, were, we were going up the mountain, 
and, uh, and Locke asked me, what's my budget at SAP? Because I was bitching about my budget cycles. and You, you were know. number two of SAP uh, yeah, and about and, to become and, the next and, uh, CEO. And I told him that my budget is a billion euro. And, um, and he said if, I, if he could come and run my budget just, just once, that would be great. <laughs> um, and you, you, we're, you know, we're both lucky. I think a lot of, of the, the, the people in that group were very lucky. We, I started just like all of you guys. I was an entrepreneur. I built four companies. I was almost bankrupt. I got lucky. I sold two of them. And then I ended up in a large company. And I sort of grew within that company. And in a sense, it provided me the ability to grow a personal platform. So the, the question is, you get to that you know, sort of almost midlife crisis, 35, 36, 37. And, and then you get asked, what are you going to do with your, with your life? What do you do with this platform? And, um, and your I think life being the platform here. The life, the, the time you got on this planet, the abilities that you, you've sort of studied and understood and, and, and gathered. And then, you know, no, no disrespect, I, you know, I love what, what the Zynga guys have done and the ability to actually do all these kinds of social networks. And then you see, you can apply it to get um, people to fund all kinds of great initiatives. You, you can see that even if you build a, a, uh, a virtual farm, every once in a while you can come up and think, can I also change the way we do farming? Real, real world, real stuff. And I think that's where a lot of us are getting into the point where we're saying um, it's not just enough to build a courier. It's not just enough to make money because uh, uh, what, what do you do with all that money? You know, how do you make that platform about making change in the real world? What's, what's the big question that, um, that we're supposed to tackle? In, in, this, uh, in this life we, we were granted. And, um, and I got asked that and question. And so you think farming, virtual farms is not? No, I think virtual farms is a great way to get people to interact and it's a, it's a great social uh, tool. But the, again, the question is once you understood how you do that and you understood how you mobilize millions of people, um, I think you, if, if you're doing what these guys are doing, you sh you're smart enough to actually figure out how to mobilize these millions of people, not to just do virtual farming, but to do you know, change farming, change the way you can save yep. countries after disasters. You can do a lot of different things. And if you just apply the same tools, the same personal platform to a different application. Like Joe, of course, is doing. And yeah, right. So, so, so you switched into let's save the world. That's right. Um, and, and what I figured out is the platform I, I've learned at SAP is, is to take a, a big technological problem, break it into a lot of small pieces, figure out the solution to the pieces, and then put it back together again. But you got to apply it to your passion. And my passion was peace in the Middle East. And when I try to connect the two, I figured if, if we can get the Middle East to wean off of oil as the, sort of the, the main economic power, then all these countries would have to uh, divest, if you want, from oil economy into tourism and into um, education and into um, banking and media. And, you see what happens at the, Emir at the Emirates, you, you become modern. Yep. And by virtue of becoming modern, you want peace. And so I basically said, here's a way to get to peace in the Middle East with technology, which is what I know how to do. And you see that the same tools that apply to make a next version of SAP can apply to end oil. It's, it's the same set of, of capabilities, if you want, inside your platform. It's just a different application. And we ended up, by doing so, we built in a, a, a platform. I mean, we, we, um, we've built a platform to make electric cars cheap and convenient. And those cars become a platform because there's a, an operating system that we put inside the car to enable people here to build applications for the new platform called a, a new mobility platform. It's the first time you actually have uh, a wired computer inside the car, which is always connected through cell phones and Wi-Fi, and it's got all this knowledge about the driver. So you can build applications on top. So there's a a chain of platforms from the personal platform to the physical platform to the car as a platform. And, and all of us mobilized together, not only end oil, it's also good business. And I think that if, if you do something that makes a change in the world and is good business, you get a lot of money to come in and, and really drive it forward. And at the end of the day, you, you accomplish big things. And I think that's, that's the best use of your life. Wow. Thank you, Shai. Thank it's you. Uh, very impressive, very, very inspiring. I, I really appreciate that you took, took the time in your uh, changing the world Thank to you. share this with us. Thank you. And uh, we'd love to help as well. So, you know, if, if you want to 
help Shayin his initiative, uh, we'll we'll make sure to connect you. Just email me or uh, Shay is really Thanks. easy to reach. Thank you so much, Shay. And you'll Thanks. be around a little bit. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you.